Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Anna Melda Radice, Executive Director of the American Folk Art Museum. The American Folk Art Museum preserves, conserves, and interprets a comprehensive collection of works made by self-taught artists with objects dating from the 18th century to the present. Anne has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Anne, for joining us today. Glad to be asked. So folk art in the United States has had an amazing, amazing history. Yes. And folk art comes to us from before the founding of the country. And of course, your collection focuses mm -hmm. on the 18th century to today. Mm -hmm. Talk about the extent of the, of the collections that you uh, manage and well, that you expose. Every, um, every first-rate collection of anything has to have a variety of media. And indeed, uh, our works are paintings, sculptures, uh, ceramics, uh, rugs, quilts, you name it, weather vanes, uh, and even some of the um, constructions of more contemporary folk. So it's a challenge, obviously, to um, keep everything in good shape, uh, to keep everything um, available as much as we can, and to get our art out there. And do you also subcontract with conservators who have particular expertise to come in and, and work on particular absolutely. collections? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, that would be most likely a, an individual object or a set of objects um, that we're preparing for an exhibition or perhaps for digitization or, you know, just uh, when something requires a very special eye. Fortunately, the United States is filled with wonderful conservators. So. Give us a sense of your exhibition philosophy. The exhibition philosophy is one of presenting both the traditional and also what we call self-taught and art brute. Um, self-taught and art brute have often been tagged outsider art. We don't use that phrase because these artists, all of them, were part of the American story or part of, even though we are, our title is a, the uh, American Folk Art Museum, we do have collections that are not American as well. And our philosophy is to present both, and sometimes we alternate a traditional show, then a, you know, non, you know, then a, a self-taught show. Right now we have a major exhibition that has been funded by the Luce Foundation that we put together called Self-Taught Genius. And it, it is a collection of some of our, our most important pieces, both traditional and self-taught. And the show, 110 pieces, uh, when it closes in August, will go on the road to the Figgy Museum, the Menge, the New Orleans Museum of Art, the Eamon Carter, St. Louis, and the Tampa Museum of Art. So it's our philosophy, get the art out there. You have as many people as possible see it, lend to other collections, um, update our website, which we're doing, so that people will have a virtual museum as well. Uh, because we find that, again, uh, the virtual world reinforces the, quote, real world, and also it does uh, give an opportunity for those folks who, alas, will never come to New York to have the opportunity to share in, uh, in, you know, in, our, in our artwork. There are also significant challenges that attach to placing uh, the, uh, the self-taught artist within a, a historical context. Mm -hmm. uh, talk about how your curators, how your education department, mm -hmm. take these individuals who are individualists among individualists. That's right. Many of them are. Well, they are a certain, first of all, even the most unusual personalities, let's say, have produced a body of work. So you right. can identify, oh, that's so-and-so, or that's this one, or that's that one. So consequently, there's something to uh, speak to us. And you have to, it's not that you want to over-contextualize and take the life out of the artwork, right. but I think it's really important to understand the background of some of the artists, where they lived, you know, what their beliefs were. Um, and it's uh, it's presented in a way that is non-judgmental and, um, is accurate and allows people to relate any way they want to. That's one of the things I find fascinating about folk art. It's so accessible. It doesn't mean it's not important. It means that it has a quality which includes people. And, and I mean, my background is all traditional. It's Renaissance art. It's Renaissance architecture. And yet, and it's business. And, 
and yet there are just pieces even when you put a traditional piece next to a self taught more contemporary piece they just talk to each other i mean there's a real there's something pretty interesting going on and and that's why our audiences are are can be a famous art historian standing next to a kid and getting both of them enjoying what they're looking at and there are so many museum directors that are uh, would be very envious of the of the diverse audiences that you're able to attract yeah. into your institution talk about how you segment your audience and mm -hmm. and taking a look at at your visitors and how, how many people visit the museum well we'll be over 125,000 this year and um, this is a significant uh, raise for rise for us in the, in attendance um, our visitors, uh, you know, we have the traditional tours for children, of course, right. but and we have a lot of adult learning things that are different levels. We have one day a week, one evening a week, because we're open, our hours are 11.30 to 7, so we get people who are coming home from work, uh, going to, we're, we're across the street from Lincoln Center, who are going to Lincoln Center, who stop by. So it's really an experience, uh, whether you want to go to the store or look at a work of art or, or be part of a program that we might have going on. So it's, uh, we make a special effort to reach out um, to young people, to the, what we call the mid-age group that now everyone's worried about, mm -hmm. and making sure they come right. back. And also, uh, we started cross-marketing and co-marketing, if you will, with the Museum of American Design and the Museum of Biblical Art, who are our closest neighbors. And we find that um, working together, uh, people are, are happy to know if they're coming to town. Oh, we can see three things in one You can create floor. a sort of a, a, a mini ecosystem amongst you. So that <laughs> th there isn't necessarily the, the sensibility of competition. It's more of a question of, no. of how do you create a a nexus where people can come and have dissimilar mm -hmm. experiences but all within the same vein. Yeah, and I've, um, my whole career has been based on um, what, what people used to call the general public. Uh, even when I started out many years ago at the National Gallery, it, it's always been something that I've been concerned about because it doesn't really mean much to just get people into a museum who already know you know, the 13th century Italian art or, or 18th century folk art. So you're it's not just talking to <laughs> other, other curators, no, other academics? We love academics. to talk to them, but we don't. <laughs> but my, um, luckily I have two brilliant curators, uh, uh, Stacy Hollander, who's our deputy director and head of collections, who's been there a number of years, mm -hmm. and Dr. Valerie Rousseau, who concentrates on the self-taught in our group. Well, they carry the intellectual heft I'm the barker. I'm out there <laughs> getting people in because I know once they come through that door, their their lives are going to be affected positively. So, luckily, um, Stacy and Valerie let me sort of do my thing, and I definitely let them do their thing. You had referred previously to the fact that uh, you had referred to yourself as having both museum experience mm -hmm. and business experience. Let's talk a little bit about the the sure. business aspects. <laughs> How? How have you cultivated in your career? It's very your funny. Um, when, um, I, when I started at the National Gallery, the director was Carter Brown, whom we all still worship. Uh, Carter became a bit of he became a mentor to me, and uh, he said to me once, "What do you want to be? You know, when you grow up, basically." Since I was 23, and a very junior varsity person, and I said, "I want to be a museum director," and he said, "Well." you know there aren't many women museum directors. Now luckily that's no longer, <laughs> he said, so you'll need to get an MBA. And I said, okay. And I said, well, I'm, at that time I was just about to start uh, at the U.S. Capitol first as the architectural historian, then as the curator in the office of the architect of the Capitol, where we did a lot of conservation. And um, he said, you really need it. I said, okay, not law school. He said, nope, business school. So I went every night for five years to get my MBA, and he said to me, now don't get it in something lightweight. He said, get it in finance. So I did, I got it in finance. And I have to say that um, he, was so, he was so wise on that one because really a museum director's job is no longer simply the aesthetic uh, right. sensibilities of a collection. It's really, 
I mean, it's really knowing how much each object costs in the store or, no, or having some work for you who knows that, and it's really keeping accountability going. And, and we Understanding do. your earned income streams, your contributed Everything. income streams, <laughs> all your costs, and yep. ensuring that when you, when, when, when you're planning exhibitions, you're, yeah. you're anticipating the costs of conservation, of preservation, of, of hanging, of, of security, of, of, the of, of everything, <laughs> of the leaflets. Yeah, well, in fact, um, I've been the director of the American Folk Art Museum for about two years. And the first thing I did, my first staff meeting, I brought in the budget and the financial statement. And I said, we're all going to learn about these. You didn't They're, show it to everybody, everybody, did you? Every staff person knows because every staff person owns this. This is, you know, his or her museum as well. The success of the museum is based on every individual in the museum. So does that mean that the management and the success of the museum is not just the executive director's job? <laughs> I think it's part cheerleader. It's part uh, being an orchestra leader. It's about rewarding people when they do well. It's about it's about accepting responsibility, even if things, if there's a problem. I've really always throughout, my management style has always been, A, it's about the institution. It's about the people who build the institution. It's about having the right people and about re accepting responsibility and telling them if something goes wrong, tell me right away, don't wait, don't hide it. We'll, we'll fix it together. So I think people respond to um, that kind of, approach. And it serves to break up the various silos that yeah, sometimes very museums... very anti-silos. I'm very anti-silo. <laughs> so if there's a problem, mm -hmm. people, if, if, if there's a, um, if there's some uh, trash on the, on the floor, anybody oh, will come, will we'll pick bend it up. down and pick it up. It's, Absolutely. There's none of this, it's not my job kind of thing nope. because the, the success of the museum mm -hmm. and the quality of the museum experience yeah. is everybody's One thing I started uh, which was just a natural thing to do was um, when we have an opening, you know, there's a front door, so right. to speak, people come through. I stand there and I ask a staff member to join me and we greet people. And we greet them for about an hour and then you know, usually we have, you know, remarks we make or something. Right. But everybody comes and everybody gets to know people and everybody feels that you know, greeting people and introducing them to the artwork is, is important. We're ambassadors for the art. And um, because we, have, we're, we reach out to museums throughout the United States and we have, you know, good working relationships, um, they, they know we're going to deliver. And everybody at that museum feels that they've got to deliver, and it's including one of the, the director. <laughs> <laughs> and because of its position in New yeah. York and, and, mm -hmm. and in the field, it's one of the more prominent of, of these museums throughout it's well the country. It's well-known, yeah, it's well-known, yeah. What does your budget look like? I have kept the budget at $3.5 million, but then, uh, and we were, I've been there two years, we were in the black both years significantly. Uh, but then any special project that's really big dollar, like Loose, which is $1.6 I keep that separate because oh. I don't want people, I mean, it looks really great when you say, oh, we, this year our budget was $5 million. Well, you know, that's not really the operating budget of the museum. Let's be honest. Let's. So you separate the blockbuster from, uh, absolutely. from the standard operating right. budget. Right, and, and uh, we, we're doing now, we're going to do four shows a year. Okay. Um, probably one will be of the, in quotation mark, blockbuster, but the others will be very solid, very good, um, not cheap, but definitely budgeted for and thought of as part of the operations. Because indeed, what draws people to the museum are, are good shows. Well, it's the mix, right? It's you're, the you, mix. You're, you're dealing in a portfolio world in which you are trying to create a portfolio of experiences that attract people mm -hmm. and that also tie to your budgetary stability, your financial stability. Mm -hmm. So having the appropriate balance is, is very important to yeah. any business. Yeah. If, every, if any business just, just spends, uh, they're likely to get a, a, a lot of splash and, and also huge deficits. Mm -hmm. Someone asked me uh, recently, uh, because obviously we're starting to, um, to build up the endowment again right. to get back um, uh, to a certain place, 
And the person said, oh, that's great. That means you'll get a new building. You do this. And I said, whoa, first, we're going to gain all of that beautiful reputation throughout the United States that this museum deserves. Now, one thing I have done, is so, as with any museum, so many things are in storage. I mean, right. vast numbers of things are in storage. And our storage contract was coming due. And, of course, the person who owned the storage wanted to put it into the sky uh, because the location had become very trendy. It wasn't so <laughs> trendy when we, I guess, rented it. So we looked around New York, and we found a fabulous space in Queens, not so far from PS1, not so far from other things. Very nice. 15-minute subway ride. And I, uh, the board, we looked at a lot of places. This is 17,500 square feet of totally usable space. So we have a plan. We're calling it the Annex, and it'll, we'll open it in January. It'll have storage. We're going to rent out 4,500 square feet, so I'm going to be a landlady now. And we're going to have another exhibit space and our library and archives. So oh, we interesting. get some action going. So on. you have an earned income opportunity. Mm -hmm. You have a second exhibition right. space. Um, library and research. You have center. a library and research center. Plus, you have storage. Your okay. storage. Right. Plus, you're also immunizing yourself from future shifts in, right. in rent. That's right. But in order to do that, you also need to acquire competence, new competencies in managing this space, mm -hmm. in Correct. being a landlord, in dealing with all the <laughs> permitting and so on. Oh, yeah. And so you also have to think about balancing your staff competencies and, and ensuring mm -hmm. that you have the attorneys that are going to be looking over these contracts and so on. Oh, yeah. How does your board contribute to your success? Well, it's a very active board. Not only have they been very generous financially, but we have a really stellar finance committee, budget com or audit committee. Um, we have an education committee. We have uh, a committee that deals with uh, accessioning works of art. Um, we will have a library committee again. The museum had one at one time. We're going to re redo that. Uh, very, we have a development committee. These are all, many people are business people. Some of them are philanthropists and, you know, are used to, and some of them have long history with the museum itself. Uh, so there's this love of the, for the museum, but there's also sort of hard nose, okay, how are we going to get this done? Explain, and you're absolutely right. I mean, in becoming uh, the landlord, we, we did all kinds of investigation on what this really meant and liability and this and that. I mean, you know, more than a human being needs to ever know for their entire, his or her entire lifetime. But we, we did the due diligence because we, you know, we have the responsibility to do that. So your board is contributing their time, mm -hmm. their treasure. Mm -hmm. their expertise, mm -hmm. their skepticism. Absolutely. Their but labor. Needed. <laughs> uh, but needed. Uh, right. partic particularly in, in managing risk as, yeah, uh, as you right. evolve, as you grow. I was recently at the um, Art Museum Directors meeting, which is always a, actually a very important meeting. AAMD. AAMD. And we had uh, a lot of our, I call them our brothers and sisters who are who are museum directors have uh, are fortunate and have these large endowments, so that if things go a little into the red, they simply go into the endowment. Now that might be everyone's dream is to have an endowment where you don't have to care. It's not my dream. Um, I I grew up with a, a a doctor father who said to me once, "If you make a million dollars and you spend a million in one, you're in debt." So <laughs> I've never forgotten that, and I think that. Um, we gain more support by showing sort of fiscal responsibility. And asking people to put money into an endowment doesn't mean they're just covering your backside all the time. So I feel, sort of, I feel strongly about that. And financial management allows you to pursue your mission, which is to yes. expose folk art mm -hmm. to, the, to the visiting public yes. and to take them on that transportative journey that connects them to their own creative potential. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. No question. Anna Maldoraduce, thank you so much for sharing the work of the museum, and thank you so much for your insights. Thanks very much. Thanks.